I'm Adrian Fabris from the Gelatural Survey, um, Acting Program Coordinator for the Mineral Systems and um, Commodity and Resource Assessment and Advice teams. So I would also like to second um, really uh, Carmen's comments there with welcoming everyone here. It's fantastic to have such so much interest in um, this topic and um, have so many people registered to come here and then also online. Um, you know, we ask ourselves, um, why, why is everyone here? Why does this workshop happen? Um, and it's really uh, probably four or five years ago now, we could see some building interest in, in said copper in South Australia. And, you know, we, we uh, were thinking about, you know, what kind of project we could put together um, that could really help um, exploration community in, in South Australia and uh, the opportunity um, came together um, and we started a, a three-year project with um, uh, with CSIRO with their basin analysis team um, and that's that kicked off uh, a bit over a year ago so uh, the focus of the um, um, project is really initially in the Stewart Shelf and Torrens Hin Zone um, and that's mainly because of, you know, the known mineralisation um, in that region, but also because that's the region we thought in three-year project we could make the most um, impact with the kind of things that we could do. Um, so, that, uh, but I must, you know, say that we are also always be, uh, going to be thinking about the prospectivity and, and the opportunities within the, the rift complex um, itself. So the, the aims of this three-year project is to improve knowledge of the uh, basin architecture, um, try to re so re-log a, a heap of holes um, with a sequence stratigraphic um, kind of framework, um, log lithofaces, thicknesses, um, distributions of units in the Stewart Shelf and, and the um, Torrentine Zone, um, and also try to... Um, you know, log thicknesses and distributions of underlying basins as well, which have strong um, influence on the neoprot. Um, and, you know, I suppose more my component of it is understanding what ingredients are, are key for these mineral systems. So what are the controls? Um, so relogging of holes and collecting a heap of data on those drill holes. So this workshop, um, you know, in, in about a year into this project, is around somewhat the state of play, getting an update of what companies are up to, really explaining what we're doing in this um, project and where we're up to. But also the theme that I want out of it is trying to discuss um, what are the exploration techniques, what are the questions, what are the key questions for, for us to be thinking about as well as we go forward in the next couple of years and, and um, you know maybe as a community. Okay, so I'll get into my talk. So in this talk I'll, I'll give you a bit of context, um, start with just explaining the uh, the model for, for said copper, the um, generic kind of um, model, explain why there is interest in, in South Australia and, um, and summarise kind of the styles of mineralisation that we generally see um, in SA and then and, and for these systems and then provide a few insights from, from previous studies. So um, the said hosted strata-bound copper deposits are characterised by disseminations, cements and, and veinlet hosted copper minerals that are pretty much conformable to their sedimentary or metasedimentary host rocks. The deposits are usually relatively thin um, but can be laterally extensive you know, so over quite a few kilometres, um, with copper grades from one to to three percent being typical, but remobilisation, supergene processes, you can get some very high grades um, in these deposits, and there certainly are some very high grades um, in in um, the African copper belt. So all bodies uh, commonly hosted in sandstones, shales, or, or dolomitic units within intricate intracratonic uh, sedimentary basins. Uh, the ore genesis involves the circulation of um, 
a fluid within brines, within a sedimentary basin, um, which transport copper and precipitate these at redox boundaries, which are either um, primary or, or secondary reduced um, units. So we think of shales like the Kupfer Schiefer, um, but sandstones um, uh, common hosts as well, and these can be um, originally reduced or reduced um, by mobilisation of, of um, a reductant into those. And something that's often talked about is um, mobile hydrocarbons in these systems, and um, sour gas is something that, that's talked about. So um, a lot of deposits for said copper occur around leaky uh, petroleum systems. So the model that's often shown is the Hitzman model up there. And um, uh, I try not to use my laser pointer. Um, but basically, uh, circulation stewing of brines within that lower um, red bed sequence within a basin that's formed during the rift phase. Um, and really stripping metal out of um, uh, both the, the, the fuel, the red beds, the, the mafic materials that are common in early phases of, um, of uh, the rifting, and also basement um, is, is talked about to some extent. These fluids move up um, uh, um, the um, growth faults on the, and particularly um, precipitate the copper minerals around the, the um, shoulders of the basin and an important ingredient is having a, a cap, a cap rock seal on the deposit that really facilitates that stewing of juices and, 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 and big um, circulation systems to strip copper out of more and more material and that's one of the keys for forming big deposits is big circulation cells and a lot of um, stripping of, of metal out. So you know there's a lot of similarities between this kind of model and a petroleum kind of model when you're thinking of source and seals and, and trap sites. Um, so just shown there is the variety of um, locations. Um, so you, you have them at the first reductant, but commonly you see it up the stratigraphy, but usually it's that um, lower um, reductant that the biggest deposits form in. So the Katangan Basin, which is the basin hosting the African Copper Belt, um, formed at, um, the, as, as a response to the breakup of Rodinia. Um, so at the same time, the Centralian Super Basin was forming in, in Australia. Um, and in South Australia, we have the Adelaide Super Basin. So um, this is described by um, Jared Lloyd, who's in the, in, the, um, in the audience here. So the Adelaide Super Basin um, is made up of a few components, and these are terms you'll hear um, commonly through the day. Um, so the Adelaide Rift Complex is the, I suppose, the, the depot center in the most part. Um, there's a Torrens Hin zone that sits um, to the west, which is the shoulder is a shoulder. Um, the Stewart Shelf is the only a reduced part of the, or I shouldn't say reduced, only um, the Umbratna or the, um, and Wilpena, the upper parts of the stratigraphy um, that are deposited on the um, Gawler Craton. But um, the Adelaide Super Basin extends out to the east over the, the Kernamona province, and where it's known as the Kumbalani Platform, and it also um, extends north under the Warburton Basin. Um, so just to give you a feel for the stratigraphic um, units and, and as I go up um, uh, sequence, I just want you to keep in mind that model that's in the top right corner. So uh, LA Super Basin, we, well, we start with basement um, you know, this is one of the, the things going for um, this neck of the woods is that we know certainly in the Gawla we have a highly enriched um, basement of uh, demonstrated, you know, ISCG deposits. Uh, we know from seismic lines that um, the Gawla continues under the Adelaide Rift Complex. 
exactly um, what's under there is, is a bit uncertain, but um, it's fair to um, assume that it's enriched um, uh, in, ter uh, enriched in terms of um, source rocks there. So we move up to the Kalana group. Um, this is the rift phase of um, um, deposition and importantly uh, may, um, igneous units, mafic units and lots of um, evaporites. So just the all, all the dye appears and there's many of them in the Adelaide Rift complex as demonstration of that, um, the amount of salt that um, is in that system that's particularly in the Kurtamurka Kurtimur subgroup. So we add salt to the system, brines, move up to the borough group, this is renewed extension um, and more classics and, and carbonates and, and um, uh, you, we've got um, magnesite, quite a bit of magnesite associated with um, in the borough group. Uh, move up to the Umbaratna group where we have um, the first suppose, major uh, reductant in the Tapley Hill formation. Um, potentially this is also a seal, or how effective of a seal it is. Um, not completely sure, but this would also be considered to be a seal. Um, and then the um, post Maranoan glacial um, cap carbonate of the Nakalina um, sitting within the um, Wilpina group. So these are the components that make up the um, said copper system, that are, they're all there. Jumping um, to the top there, the Delamirian orogeny, um, also similar in, in the African copper belt, we have the um, Pan African or Lephilian um, orogeny at a similar kind of time. Um, so Delamirian providing opportunity for movement along faults and, and, and movement of, of fluids as well. Then when we look at an approximate location of um, uh, copper deposits within the stratigraphy, you do actually see them at a range of stratigraphic levels. Um, in the Stewart Shelf, we, we focus on around the Tapley Hill Formation and, and, um, and Waila um, Sandstone. Um, in the Rift Complex um, proper, it's at a range of stratigraphic levels up to, to the Banyaru. Um, and I must point out that in the African Copper Belt, the, the main deposits would actually sit in the equivalent of the Kalana group. Um, okay, so what do we see in, um, in, you know, in South Australia in terms of styles of copper, said copper mineralisation? Now, um, we had Mitch Bockman do some work in um, trying to classify the um, copper occurrences in, in South Australia. We often show um, all the occurrences in South Australia, but the question was how many of those can you actually relate to this deposit style? So out of uh, around a thousand um, occurrences in this region, we um, try to classify those into a range of um, subtypes. And um, um, basically got that down to about 600 where 660 I think that uh, could be classified into uh, a said copper system and overall they, they range in a, um, a few different styles there's the more classic like strata bound deposits hosted in reduced sandstones and, and shales um, uh, that you see in the Stewart shelf and, um, and, and also uh, in the Mount Gunson area in, in, um, uh, in um, glacial, um, sorry, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Anyway, the periglacial um, brecciated Pandora formation. Um, there's also a lot of uh, structural related ones, so generally put in the structural category where there's a few subtypes. So there's deposits related, they're hosted within dye piers. This is in the Adelaide Rift Complex. There's um, mineralisation on the boundaries, um, reactive units around dye piers. Um, but there's also a number of occurrences, quite a few that um, are just within some kind of structural feature, like a shear zone uh, breccia um, and, or in a fold, um, fold hinge, um, and without um, further context, um, these, 
which we don't always have. These are just lumped into a, a general structural um, category and sometimes can overlap with the, the Dye peers um, kind of uh, styles influence from the Dye peers. They're also just vein hosted mineralization um, and uh, superficial or super gene um, occurrence where we don't have any additional information. Um, and they are you know, relatively common in the um, LA Rift complex. This is another way of looking at that um, uh, same kind of data that was in that map. So the greens are more the classic um, strata bound um, occurrences, the white, uh, it's a bit hard to tell the difference between the gray and the white, but the, I think the gray is structural and the, and the white is veins, um, which you can see cluster in the allied rift complex and the surface or supergene um, occurrences. Um, so what you're looking at there is some 3D surfaces that um, we've begun to put together, George Guthus. Um, so depth of basement and some of the surfaces that we're modeling and all those dots are the occurrences that we've classified um, into those different categories and, and, and the 662. But the great thing about when, when you do this classification is the, um, um, is, is being able to do some statistics on it. So about 12.5% are related to dye peers. Um, 19% are dominantly um, surface occurrences, so you know quite a few, but not not that many. 16% um, of all these occurrences are hosted in Tapley Hill formation only, really a surprise. And 50%, um, but uh, of the deposits, 50% uh, are hosted actually hosted in Tapley Hill formation, hence the interest. And another interesting thing that was really pulled out of um, of doing this that Mitch Bachman um, noticed is we looked at the element association and the gold, um, the occurrences with um, gold in it really um, focus mostly around the Nacra arc, so those in the room, um, around the edge of the Murray Basin and you know it really does point to the um, the Delamirian um, and, and post Delamirian um, intrusives around there having an influence on these systems. So overall occurrences, some um, tonnages there, um, relatively small. Um, the most significant in terms of production in, in the past has been from the cattle grid and Mount Gunson area um, deposit, but the biggest is um, ME Bluff, um, that's uh, in terms of um, available resource and, and hopefully you know, Matt Weber will talk more about that um, later today um, and um, uh, their, their um, coder are doing a lot of work on any bluff try to get a resource there so now I'd just like to quickly go through some information uh, uh, I suppose I insights from case studies or research that has been done on a few case studies that really point towards some controls on, on mineralization yep so the the three examples I'd like to give are Kapunda, uh, Mole Creek, and Mount Gunson. So Kapunda famously, um, you know, the first uh, metal mine in, in um, Australia and um, saved South Australia from financial ruin. Um, it's, uh, historically, they, they extracted out the, um, you know, focus on the high-grade um, veins. Um, the mate it's hosted in Tapley Hill formation. Uh, the controls are lithology and, and, and major structures, which may well be inverted um, growth faults. Um, and the mineralization is both um, disseminated within um, the, um, the actual Tapley Hill formation in certain units and also within vein systems. So Lambert et al. Um, did some work on Kapunda, really defined of, of the overall Tapley Hill formation thickness of about 700 meters. Um, a couple of different units that, um, that the mineralization was restricted to. So particularly dolomitic units, and they found that um, they had low organic carbon contents, that um, the, you know, the mineralized units were more, had more dolomite compared to calcite um, that changed um, laterally and that's the first 
note I've seen of um, albi alteration, which is another thing that you generally see in these systems um, at, at Kapunda. You see that. that. Um, so veins are up to 30 centimeters in, in thickness. Um, interestingly, no framboidal pyrite um, textures seen um, from what they, Lambert looked at. So um, suggesting some recrystallization that's happened. But really interestingly, the veins were noted in, in Lambert's work to be restricted to these mineralized, um, uh, the mineralized intervals and that you actually see perturbations of the, the, the bedding around these veins suggesting that, that they've formed in unlithified sediments. Um, sulfur isotopes suggest no mimetic input and um, they formed at relative, the deposits for mineralization relatively low temperature and highly saline um, fluids. Um, the interpretation was that copper is focused in, in more permeable units and um, kind of form during movement along these structures or, and possibly um, during the early onset of the Delamirian um, orogeny. Uh, speaking to a few people um, yesterday, um, there, while these structures seem to form during soft sediment, there, there's, um, there looks to be lots of um, additional um, veins that um, look later than those early ones that were described by Lambert. So controls being permeability, um, source of sulphur, a sulphitic unit, um, and growth faults and, and possibly inversion of those growth faults. So just moving to Mole Creek. Um, Mole Creek, located close to Ish to Port Augusta, that's located on the um, margin of the Beta Basalt. Um, it's uh, quite an extensive um, uh, strike extent of mineralization along that margin. Um, it's hosted with, again, the Tapley Hill Formation and then also um, the Pandora Formation and um, the Backy Point Formation, which is the classic sediments associated with the beta basalt. Uh, but interestingly, the highest grades of copper um, are within Tapley Hill Formation where they sit over the top of Pandora Formation. Um, so this is suggesting that the Pandora Formation is actually acting as an important um, you know, uh, uh, aquifer or um, a pathway um, and is, an important, is it part of this system, the Pandora Formation. So just there, also note that there's a number of other occurrences along strike of um, that boundary. Um, in terms of the more detailed studies, uh, Mason um, showed framboidal pyrite here, but also some replacement and infill textures of the sulphide, so some secondary um, sulphide forming. Um, again, no evidence for hydrothermal activity um, at Mole Creek, um, and they were saying near neutral brines. Um, interesting work from Codes, and Indrani will tell us more about some of the work that Codes have been um, have, have done in this region on focusing on Tapley Hill formation. They looked at the lead isotopes of pyrite and found um, a radiogenic source, so a, a, a um, a, a signal for a radiogenic source of the, um, the sulphide um, there, suggesting that um, you know, it's a uriniferous um, source rock. Um, and the same signature is found at any bluff, and one wonders then what that actually means in terms of what the source is for this region, and, and potentially um, and, and whether the beta basalt is sufficient to explain it for Mile Creek. Um, lastly, Mount Gunson. So Mount Gunson, um, is, there's a number of samples downstairs from the cattle grid deposit. Um, these are permafrost breaches. So the image in the centre is the chalcosite mineralisation that you get in those, in, in the matrix between the class and on the left, the uh, image that um, Carmen's taken of more uh, some sec secondary um, copper that's in the matrix. And on the right, uh, an image provided by Martin Hand, um, and it really shows the, the pyrite texture and, and the secondary nature of the, the copper um, smashing the earlier pyrite to pieces. Um, 
So here, a key control is the um, Pernati High. Um, so shown on the left is the 2 million geology um, of the Pandara formation in that, that brownie kind of yellowy colour. Um, and um, when we, we can see that there's a number of uh, occurrences that are clustered around the Pernati High, on the right is a zoom in with a bit more geology and you can see the deposits sit in and around that on and onto the sides of that Panadi High. Um, so yellow is the Pandara formation, the green is the, um, the Neopro units. So it sits in both of those. That makes a little bit more sense when you look at this um, cross section or cartoon where it shows deposits sitting within um, Wireless sitting over the top of um, Pandara formation, but also um, the remnants of, of Tapley Hill formation sitting over the top. Um, again, so the sulfur isotopes from Tapley Hill suggest um, no magmatic um, high temperature input. Um, and the, the, the age of mineralization, I suppose, has some constraint on it in terms of um, that we have. Uh, mineralization at the top of the Tapley Hill formation, suggesting that the Wyler formation did um, function as a, flu a pathway fluid movement, um, and and um, so you get mineralization at the top. So it has to be after Wyler um, it was deposited. Um, and looking at the element association with mineralization around here, they found things like the rare earths were enriched and later. Um, Nuts and Jan Nutson suggested a, um, a 1590 source for the mineralization here. I'll skip past that one. So in conclusions, um, the Adelaide uh, Super Basin um, kind of ticks a lot of boxes in terms of uh, components of the mineral system with a lot of demonstrated um, copper occurrences of a variety of styles. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of key controls, um, we've got lithology and sedimentology being important, structures, um, pathways or uh, aquifers being, you know, Pandara and Wyler, sandstone, fault blocks um, are in, an important control, um, having a local source, rock, and diaperism are all controls. So I, I, I'm not going to go through these questions, I'll just leave that up for you to have a look through while we go to the next um, presentation, but these are questions that we um, might pose at the discussion um, question uh, session. But certainly, where are the big deposits is, is an important um, question for us to ask ourselves.